Right, well, here we are, comfortably reclining on a pile of logs. Um, another ideal place to sit and read. And what I've decided for today is uh, to break with tradition, so to speak, shock the critics, and actually cover a book review. The title of the article is The Pillage of India. And the author is Christopher de Belague. It's about a book which I would really like to cover at some point. It's called The Anarchy by William Dalrymple, subtitled The East India Company, Corporate Violence and the Pillage of an Empire. I have read The Last Mughal, also by William Dalrymple, and it's a very, very good book, so I thought this will be excellent. But I've read other reviews of this and they all speak very, very highly of it. I'd like to get a hold of this book because it's very important for my theme of the rule of law. The thing is that the England and then Britain developed increasingly close approximations to the rule of law over the centuries after Magna Carta. With the exception of the situation in Ireland, it is really true to say that the subject lived under a certain approximation of the rule of law. You could make slight exceptions for the Gaelic-speaking Highlanders of Scotland and so on. And what is absolutely equally true is that in the Empire there was no such thing at all. Certainly later on in the Empire it is possible to argue that Britain instituted something approximating roughly to the rule of law, but to begin with not. And it's a very interesting paradox. There's the rule of law in Britain, Britain goes abroad and there's no rule of law. How deep is this belief? Or could it be the case, which is quite likely, that it was a, a system that was forced on the British authorities by the British people and when they went to places where the local people couldn't enforce something like that on them, they didn't establish it. I like William Dalrymple's approach to history. He really gets into the subject and, as it were, lives it. But I came across the following sentence. This sentence that made me decide I'd quickly talk about this book. It says, Dalrymple's ability to present events from an Indian as well as a European perspective owes much to his mining of the national archives in Delhi and his collaboration with the late Bruce Wannell, a waspish global flaneur and gifted linguist who lived in a tent on Dalrymple's lawn in South Delhi while translating Moodle-era texts for him. I thought that's the kind of book I like to read. This isn't somebody sitting in a university trying to decide what to do next in order to get tenure or whether to um, flesh out their CV with a study. This is real history. This is somebody who means it. A subsidiary uh, theme of interest in this review, can't tell you about the book because I haven't seen it yet, is Clive, Clive of India, Robert Clive. And he says here, the reviewer says here, Christopher Belaig says, the company was transformed into an instrument of imperialism under Robert Clive, a terse, pugnacious delinquent from Shropshire. Rather like that too. And it talks about all the corruption and so on, or what we would call corruption in those days, I don't think. I, I personally um, um, slightly made dishonesty, yes, saying one thing and doing another, but whether it's really in in the terms of the period corruption, I'm, I, I hear a dudes. But anyway, um, Clive clearly had a conscience of what he did and he arrived back in Britain after I think roughly 20 years in India and was able to buy so much land in Shropshire that he was one of the richest private citizens in Britain. But when Clive was investigated by Parliament on charges of amassing a fortune illegally, his achievements in defeating the French and increasing company revenues counted for more than the regime of plunder he had overseen. Now that is the intersection between the rule of law at home and the lack of rule of law abroad. The man comes home, Clive has to comply with the rules as they are in, in England, but at the same time those bodies which had instituted this system and which were, if you like to say, the guardians of them, were prepared to turn a blind eye to what he had done abroad in, as we might say, savage parts. 
Belaig carries on, and Parliament included company shareholders, uh, that is, the people who are judging him, they included company shareholders and men who owed their seats to his largesse. Clive was exonerated in May 1773. The following year, he committed suicide. And I think it's true to say nobody really knows why he committed suicide in his house in Berkeley Square. And there's one other theme here, well there's two actually, um, that relate directly to the rule of law project. Christopher de Belay talks about one of the Indians' attempts to re-establish Indian control and um, how it really fell apart due to the activities of Afghanis. They swept down from the hills Afghan chieftains um, who, had, who had been defeated by the Mughals. There's the most gruesome description of how the Afghanis dealt with the children and uh, wives uh, of the people who had defeated them. Ghulam Qadir, chieftain's son, when challenged about the fact that he inflicted the most hideous tortures on the sons and uh, Darja Empress, etc., he even killed somebody who, uh, who had saved his life when he was a baby. He gave this extremely interesting answer when asked why. He said, do you not know the old proverb, to kill a serpent and spare its young is not wise? This is a very, very in interesting illustration of the principle of collective punishment that Stalin, of course, resorted to, as we well know. And the final page of this review is also very interesting because um, Christopher de Belaig is reviewing also a book called Inglorious Empire, What the British Did to India by Shashi Tharoor, published in Melbourne. Mr Tharoor, an Indian diplomat, senior official of the United Nations, he came second in the race to become general secretary to the uh, Ban Ki-moon. Then went back to India where he has taken up the cause of uh, trying to lobby for Britain to apologise for the empire. Now that's a different subject which I'm not going to get into. But de Belaig would would like us to believe that Tharoor's assessment of British conduct is too uniformly negative to do justice to a multifaceted engagement lasted well over three centuries. And this is the rule of law point. And he says here, in the 1750s, roughly 200,000 Indians who flocked to live in British Calcutta, just a thousand or so of whose residents were European, were drawn not only by the city's wealth, but also the prospect of security from the Marathas. A recent Maratha invasion of Bengal had caused as many as 400,000 civilian deaths. An affluent and literate class of Bengalis, the Badralok, prospered alongside the companies, that's the East India Company's employees, while in the boom of the 1780s, labourers' wages rose 50%. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Bombay's impressive public works and thriving Parsi and Jewish minorities attested to intense pockets of dynamic wealth creation and multiculturalism. Nor was the empire's record of indigenization always as bad as Tharua maintains. Having been a supplier of raw jute to the mills of Dundee, by 1914 Calcutta had eclipsed the Scottish port as the world's leading manufacturer of jute products, and Indians owned 60% of the shares in the jute companies, and so on, and so on. It's a very interesting and a mixed story, but I think the, the idea that these people flocked to a place where they would get some sort of approximation to the rule of law, as opposed to being butchered by pure status addicts, as the Mughals were, and the Mongols had been, I think is a very interesting one. So there we are, this is just an article, but I thought it was very interesting, a small snippet, and uh, the book sounds fascinating. I look forward to finding out more about the way in which the rule of law did and did not, and to what extent and at what periods, arrive in India as a result of the British imperial regime there, or despite it, where there is no reciprocity, that's when you can see the character of a place. In other words, if they take full advantage of um, their power when they can, that's a bare point. 
But if on the whole they slowly get themselves together to do unto others as they would that they were themselves done unto, which is roughly what uh, establishing the rule of law in an imperial situation boils down to, then that's more of a thumbs up. So, there we are. That's that, and it's a beautiful afternoon, beautiful day, warm. As you can see, I'm in short.